Hello, and thank you for joining me for our Dean's Lecture, Cleaning Up With Science, How We're Using Science to Fix the Mess We've Made. My name is Professor Moira O'Brien, and I am the Dean of the Faculty of Science here at the University of Melbourne. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I am addressing you from the land of the Wurundjeri people and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend my respect to the traditional owners of the lands upon which our audience is gathered and to welcome any First Nations people joining us today. Our speakers will touch upon many aspects of the natural environment, including our flora and fauna, with which First Nations people have positively interacted for thousands of years. We can learn a great deal from these interactions. The Anthropocene is upon us, and we're now reckoning with issues that society has brought upon itself. Our native animals and plants are targeted by invasive pests that we've introduced for sport or nostalgia or as a short-sighted way to solve earlier problems. Their habitat has been destroyed as we clear land for urban infrastructure, mining, forestry and farmland. Our coral reefs are dying and our air, water and land is polluted by the byproducts of our modern conveniences. So what can we do about it now? Our speakers will each present their scientific solutions to an anthropogenic problem. Dr. Bradley Clark from our School of Chemistry will discuss identifying unknown problem chemicals in our environment. Dr. Ella Kennedy, a graduate of our School of Biosciences, who now works with the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, will ask whether toad smart coals are the key to saving this species. Professor Tim Fletcher from our School of Ecosystem and Forest Sciences will talk about saving urban platypuses with smart water tanks. And Associate Professor Robin Schofield from our School of Geography, Earth and Atmospheric Science will ask whether we can build tools to save our coral reefs when greenhouse gas mitigations are not happening fast enough. Our diverse range of speakers are alike in their intent to tackle human-induced environmental damage. Their aim is not to leave such challenges to the next generation, but rather to develop the scientific tools to solve these problems now. Thank you again for joining me. I will now pass to our first speaker, Dr. Bradley Clark. Dr. Clark is a senior lecturer at the university focusing on assessing the risk to public health and the environment of persistent organic pollutants. He is also the founder and chief investigator at the Australian Laboratory for Emerging Contaminants. Thanks, Bradley. Thanks very much, Moira. It's great to be here tonight to present um, some work that we've been doing at the Australian Laboratory for Emerging Contaminants. Um, I'm really interested in studying a um, a class called persistent organic pollutants. And these are chemicals that are highly persistent in the environment, but they also have the characteristic of accumulating in our bodies. And this poses real issues, particularly when they accumulate in our fat reserves and they're present in the milk. And we can, what we're seeing is this exposure to chemicals um, when children are developing. And this can cause a range of health impacts. And the, the term endocrine disrupting chemicals was coined in the 90s to really describe this, these sublethal impacts. And it can include things like reproductive health problems, impaired immune system and neurological damage. And this little graphic here shows uh, the cognitive damage that can happen to children when they're exposed. This is a Mexican study that showed the cognitive damage of children exposed to pesticides. I'm actually going to use a case study um, of PFAS, which are per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. They're used in a lot of um, modern uh, equipment that uh, are present in your everyday life. These include things like um, your, your raincoats typically will have PFAS in them, uh, your non-stick cookware, Teflon, um, your uh, stain resistant upholstery and and paints 
can also contain PFAS and also uh, food contact paper also can be a source of PFAS. So while this technology is really essential for many aspects of modern life, it actually can come with a cost. And the cost and similar to those first generations of chemicals that accumulate, accumulated in our body, um, the organochlorine pesticides and the PCBs, um, they were designed with good intentions, but they have caused environmental damage and harm. So PFAS were first introduced in the 1950s. Um, they were incorporated into a wide variety of consumer and industrial products. But it wasn't until about 50 years later that we found through the advancement of analytical measurement techniques, we found that PFOS was present in almost every person, animal and environment that was tested. And so it's this lag that happens in terms of identification of a problem that was yeah, is decades in the making. What this led to was a phase out of, um, of, of uh, the, that type of main chemical, which was called PFOS. And PFOS is still a problem in Australia today. And it's one of the most uh, significant environmental pollutants that we have in our country. And it's the, and we spend billions of dollars actually remediating contaminated sites, primarily drinking water. And one of the big issues as well is that we have now thousands of different types of PFAS. So the chemical industry's response was, when we banned and phased out these was the introduction of new and novel PFASs. So the first two PFASs were PFOS and PFOA. They have, and on this green, just might remind you a little bit of your chemistry, these green groups are the functional groups. and. Um, what they do is give the very unique chemical properties that are useful for us in modern society. And, and now in, in, through our innovations, what we've done is we've replaced the hydrogens with fluorine and made these very stable bonds. And they're very persistent in the environment um, to the point that we're not really sure if they will actually fully degrade. So this, these chemicals are persistent, they are mobile, uh, we've determined that they will bioaccumulate into um, animals and humans, and they're also being demonstrated to be toxic, including PFOS, which is being identified as a probable class two um, carcinogen. Now, the big issue here is that when we originally started in this space, we had two chemicals, but then the industry, as we start phasing out and identifying that there are problems, we get this family and this expanded universe of compounds that are being created. And this creates, um, this creates serious issues for us in terms of environmental monitoring and also uh, determining impacts. So typically what we've done historically is we use a, it's, we do targeted measurements. And what this means is that we decide prior to um, sampling a water body, sampling soil, sampling air for the measurements that we want to do. When we develop this method, we have an authentic standard that costs us a lot of money and the instrumentation cannot actually see other things in that sample. And so the area that my group is really trying to advance and work uh, to, to improve for environmental monitoring is high resolution mass spectrometry measurements. And what the difference in this approach is that it becomes a, a non-hypothesis style approach for data acquisition. What it means in reality is that we can not bias our um, environmental measurement at the start, we're not telling the instrument what to go and look for. We, we get all the information and then we interrogate it for the, the chemical load that is truly present in that sample. I'm gonna do, use a little case study of these chemicals. So we did a little study, you might remember this was a chemical warehouse fire in 2018 in Footscray. It was one of the largest urban fires in um, contemporary Melbourne's history. And it was a, a chemical storage facility holding 100,000 drums that suspiciously caught fire. It contained a range of industrial chemicals um, that included things like uh, PAHs, BTEX and PFAS. So the firefighters um, were using a non 
a fluorine free foam that they used to put it out and it took about seven days to put this fire out and this discharged water released into the nearby creek of Stony Creek where the impact with the hundreds of aquatic wildlife were found dead. So I'm going to um, walk you through some of our results from some the study that we did at this site. So site three here in the middle is where the fire um, was adjacent to the creek. And what we can see using this targeted style analysis is that there's a clear and significantly different release. So significantly elevated release of PFAS into this site. Um, sites one and two are our control sites, they're upstream. And then we can see at sites um, uh, B, uh, four and five, which are downstream, that this slug of pollution is slowly moving down the creek into Port Phillip Bay. And again, with this theme of analytical chemistry, my lab has the capability of measuring the largest suite of PFAS in the country, but still this is only 1% of the total PFASs that have been identified to this point in time. And so this group in purple that I've marked isn't normally monitored by commercial labs or regulators. And so therefore, if it wasn't included, in that method, in, in our method, we wouldn't have a, an idea, a clearer idea of the true pollution load that has been released from this event. We've sampled this site two years later and it's still releasing pollution. So when we do an untargeted style analysis, so we get much more information. So using high resolution mass spectrometry, what we found is that there were 50,000, uh, over 50,000 chemicals that were being identified in this complex mixture that was released. And we actually sampled two months later as well. And so what this, what we can do is do some advanced statistics. So this is principal component analysis with three dimensions. And we can see that during the incident, we have a similar chemical profile at site three and the downstream site. Uh, our control sites are similar. And we can also see that two months later, that we're still seeing uh, a variation in the chemical profile indicating this is still releasing chemicals into the environment two months later. Well, we know that it's releasing chemicals. The next step, next challenge really is to identify what these chemicals are. And we do this through a process of called suspect screening where we, we get these high res accurate mass data and we can compare it to databases from the US EPA and the European Union. Now, if we just take a, a snapshot into this top, uh, this is a heat map and have a top look at the top part of this, what you can see is that majority of these, we still uh, only have tentative identifications for. So the work we need to do is about uh, an un, a non hypothesis driven approach to identifying the chemicals that are important for pollution events and, in a, and it can be applied in all sorts of pollution events. Using this style of analysis, which is uh, new, we've managed to identify new and emerging PFASs that have never been identified or reported in Australia previously. And so this means that they need to be, um, further scrutiny needs to be put on these chemicals. The challenges that we face as environmental science, scientists related to pollution is are significant. With all of the modern conveniences that we have, um, we need to be thinking carefully about how we manage these. This number here is the number of unique chemicals registered in the CAS database. It's 163 million, which is, and it's, in, it's increased by 80 million in the last 10 years. So further work is needed to really understand the pollution problem. And that is my talk, and it is my great pleasure to introduce your next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Ella, Ella Kelly. And Ella is an ecologist from the, uh, uh, with a PhD in conservation biology from the University of Melbourne. Her PhD, which she completed in 2019, explored novel management strategies to prevent declines in northern coral populations. She now works as a threatened species policy officer in the Victorian Government Department of Environment, Land and Water and Planning, where she helps develop strategies for better decision making in endangered species management. Thanks, Brad. I'll just share my screen. Uh, so it's lovely to be here tonight. 
uh, to talk to you about some of the research I did as part of my PhD. Um, and I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm coming to you from tonight, which is Wurundjeri country, but also the traditional owners of the lands across Northern Australia, where I undertook this work and particularly pay my respects to the Kembe traditional owners and rangers who were integral to this body of work that I'm presenting on tonight. And so I'd like to um, introduce you to uh, one of Australia's endangered marsupials, which is the northern quoll. And so these are one of four quoll species we have in Australia. They're related to the Tassie devil and uh, they're carnivorous. So they'll pretty much attack anything that moves, which is all well and good until um, the notorious cane toad was introduced to northern Australia in 1935. And so these cane toads are poisonous. And because our native predators aren't uh, familiar with the toxin that they excrete, which is bufotoxin, it comes from glands they have on their backs. Our native predators are really vulnerable uh, to the introduction of the toads. And so they can um, experience really rapid de deaths after they unwittingly ate the cane toads. And so it's caused rapid declines in a range of native predators across northern Australia, including goannas, snakes, freshwater crocodiles, and Northern quolls. So this gives you a bit of a geographic idea of um, what I'm talking about. So the blue is the Northern quolls historic range across Australia. And we had cane toads introduced in 1935 around areas in Cairns. And they have since spread across a lot of Queensland and the Northern Territory and into Western Australia, and this map's actually a couple of years old. They're moving really quickly, and so they're probably a fair bit further than that. And unfortunately, we're expecting them to invade the vast majority of the Northern Quals range. And this is a really big problem for the species because at least 95% of the local populations will go extinct in the years following cane toad arrival. Um, but you may notice that there are some blue areas of blue in Queensland, and these are actually populations that have persisted alongside cane toads for the last 80 plus years. And they were the populations that I was really interested in exploring more during my PhD. And so we knew from previous work that these quolls that were living alongside cane toads hadn't evolved any uh, resistance to the toxin. So we thought that they were probably what we call toad smart. So they knew not to eat cane toads in the first place. And so that was the hypothesis I was working off, but I really wanted to know how they became toad smart in the first place. So was it something that they learnt through a bad experience with a smaller non-lethal toad, or was it something that their parents taught them? Or was it something innate and genetic that they could pass down to their offspring without having to teach them? And so to answer that question, I went out and I trapped as many quolls as I could in Queensland around Mareeba and Cooktown and brought them into captivity to, to look more closely at this toad smart behaviour in a controlled environment. And it was really interesting looking at the adults that I'd caught from the wild, but what I was really interested in looking at was their offspring. Uh, so they're not only super cute, but they're also very helpful from a scientific perspective. So what we were able to do with the offspring is what's called a common garden experiment, where you raise different um, strains of, of offspring in a common environment. So in this case, an environment without cane toads to look at their innate response to certain, um, to certain things. And so my key question was, do toad smart parents have toad smart babies? Is this something that's passed down through the generations? And I answered that by having three distinct lines of quolls that were raised in captivity. So we had our purebred Queenslanders, our purebred Northern Territorians who were from an offshore island off the coast of the NT, which was toad free. And so they'd never experienced cane toads before. 
and then I had some hybrids. And what I did to test whether they ate cane toads was to give them a non-lethal cane toad leg or sausage that was tasted and smelled like a toad but didn't have the lethal, lethal books bufotoxin in it. Um, and just tested whether they ate it or not. It was quite simple. And what I saw was a really strong result. So um, even just having one parent who was toad smart meant that a quoll was far less likely to consume the bit of cane toad than if they didn't. And so this really told us that this toad smart behavior is innate. So it's passed down genetically from parents to offspring and they don't need to be taught the lesson in the wild. And so this is a really exciting piece of information, uh, but how can we use it to help the quolls persist alongside cane toads into the future? And so this is where the idea of targeted gene flow comes in. And so this is a conservation strategy that um, I helped develop alongside my um, supervisor, Ben Phillips, from the University of Melbourne. And it involves translocating individuals with the genes that we're looking to promote into populations that might require that, that adaptation. And so, for instance, when it comes to quolls, we may have a population that is ahead of the cane toad invasion front. And just by chance, there may be a few individuals that are naturally picky eaters that donate cane toads. But what we know from previous in toad invasions is that most of these populations go locally extinct when toads arrive. But what we would do using targeted gene flow would be to introduce more toad smart quolls ahead of the toad invasion front. They would breed with the locals and create a population that was able to adapt and survive to the threat. And so what we did was, could we actually test this in the wild? So that was the next step. And so in 2017, we set up a experimental population on an island called Indian Island off the coast of the Northern Territory, alongside the Kembe traditional owners and rangers. And um, we released some toad smart and toad naive quolls onto the island, which had a present cane toad population. And the idea was to track selection over generations to see if that toad smart behaviour did help the population survive. So it was really trialling this idea in a controlled environment, but in the wild where there was, um, where the quolls could kind of pick their own mates and survive in the presence of cane toads. And so we released them and then the following year went back to um, trap as many as we could to get genetic samples to look at who the parents were and what genes were persisting in the population. And so this was, the idea was to track whether the toad smart genes and the Queensland genes were being more selected for in the presence of cane toads across generations. Unfortunately, uh, the island experienced a few unexpected uh, threats during this time, particularly during the quolls' first breeding season. So the population established quite well, but in the breeding season, there was a fire and then a cyclone that gave the population a real hit. So when we returned the following year, there was only a few individuals that we could trap. And it meant that the sample sizes were too small to be able to look at selection in an um, analytical way but the trends were towards the fact that toad smart genes were being selected for in the environment and it didn't dissuade us from the idea that targeted gene flow could be a viable strategy for the species. And so now it's being looked at as an idea for quoll populations in Western Australia that may be um, soon invaded by cane toads. Uh, so I just wanted to finish by kind of Pulling back a little bit, this is a viable idea for responding to the threat of an invasive species, but it's also something you could think about doing for a range of different threatening processes in conservation. So for instance, in responding to climate change, it may be possible to introduce more warm adapted individuals to areas where climate change is posing a threat to a species or um, introducing 
disease resistant individuals to populations threatened by disease. So there's a range of different uses for this idea. It just depends on whether there's that adaptive trait naturally present in the population. So that's about it for me. I'd just like to thank everybody who contributed to this. Um, there's a large range of people that you can read there, particularly Ben Phillips, who was my supervisor during my PhD. So um, thanks for listening. Now I'd like to introduce Professor Tim Fletcher, a Professor of Urban Ecohydrology at um, the School of Ecosystem and Forest Science at the University of Melbourne. And Tim will be talking to us about saving the urban platypus and using, uh, using short, uh, smart rainwater tanks and their owners. So, thanks, Tim. Thank you very much, Ella. Uh, I was hoping that I was going to have the monopoly on cute mammals, or in my case, cute monotremes, but I feel like I've been uh, pipped to that post. <laughs> Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the uh, traditional owners of the lands on which I'm coming to you from, which is the Wadawurrung uh, people, so in Western Victoria, and pay particular tribute to their elders, uh, past, present and uh, emerging. I'm going to talk to you about uh, the um, platypus and the threat that it faces in urban areas and a seemingly crazy idea uh, we have to use some uh, high-tech control systems to uh, improve its reproductive uh, success. I'll explain what all that means in a minute. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge um, the Australian Research Council who are funding this uh, research, um, but also my very long uh, term and very close collaborator, Melbourne Water, uh, Southeast Water, who have developed some of this technology, and again, a really close collaborator, and Yarra Rangers Council, with whom I've worked for 20 years and, and who uh, really are a leading council in, in trying to um, protect their, uh, their waterways. So when we uh, create urban areas or urbanise uh, land, we make really profound changes to the water cycle in those areas. We create all those, uh, all these impervious surfaces, you know, roads and roofs. Um, and of course we need them to be in uh, impervious and we've uh, very sadly seen how important that is in the, in the recent uh, storms. Um, but the, the creation of those impervious surfaces and then the connection of those uh, impervious surfaces by constructed hydraulically efficient pathways, uh, probably better known as pipes, uh, gutters and pipes, means that we convey all of this runoff into our uh, waterways. That um, water can often be polluted. It picks up all of the chemicals that exist in the urban environment. And Brad gave a, a really good uh, description of some of them. Um, but it also conveys huge amounts of water, which cause erosion, uh, scour streams out, we lose habitat. And so if you look at that picture on the right, it, I imagine that very few of you would think, yeah, that looks like a good uh, habitat for a platypus. You know, obviously all of that habitat complexity has been uh, scoured away. But we do some other things when we, uh, create these impervious surfaces, we basically cut off the, the naturally dominant pathway of water, which is actually through uh, groundwater. So most water when it rains is actually evaporated by back up into the atmosphere. So taken up by trees and, and uh, driven by the energy provided by the sun to go back up into the atmosphere. But the water that makes it into streams, most of that happens through uh, groundwater, through infiltration, and then uh, movement through the ground into our streams. That means the water is very highly filtered, but it also means it uh, is delivered to the stream very slowly. Uh, uh, a hydrogeologist, Ian Cartwright, showed that in the Dandenong Ranges, for example, some of the water you find in the streams can be 70, 80 years old. It's taken that long to get there. And so that means we have this very nice, uh, slow buffered water. So we're sort of, even during a dry period, we've got a good chance that there'll be water because 
that water has been queued up for you know 10 20 30 years when we urbanize and create all those impervious surfaces yes we create all that runoff but we also starve that source of base flow and so if we imagine ourselves to be a platypus um, yes i have a strange way of thinking but if we imagine ourselves to be a platypus we uh, uh, whacking it with all this polluted high velocity water during storms and then we're starving it of water completely at other times so it has uh, no habitat so it's not surprising we tend to see uh, population platypus uh, decline in um, urban areas if we look at this in a, a more kind of nerdy scientific way uh, these two plots are what we call hydrographs so simply uh, plots of uh, the flow rate over time these are two uh, catchments in the out towards the Dandenong Ranges um, Olinda Creek which is the natural one and Brushy Creek which is a much more urbanized and two things we see one is that very in the urban state very sharp response to rainfall so every time it rains we get that belt of water I was talking about but we also see that uh, sustained base flow this uh, black um, component here uh, that persists in the natural environment and and yet which uh, tends to disappear in the urban environment and so as I say when we put those things together that high velocity and then loss of water completely during dry periods and the pollution very uh, unsurprising we see a real loss of species not just platypus of course a whole lot of macroinvertebrates fish you know all sorts of things eels so all around the world we see this move to water sensitive urban design where we're trying to mimic the natural environment by creating things like wetlands uh, stormwater harvesting infiltration systems to try to um, uh, get some of that water back into the into the ground and those things are more or less successful are those spaces a challenge and there's all sorts of regulatory and and maintenance challenges so uh, it's still a sort of ongoing challenge that uh, myself and lots of colleagues all around the world are working on. One of the things we found is uh, to get uh, people to want to take these uh, ideas up, there needs to be a personal benefit. And here comes the idea of the humble rainwater tank, because if we install a rainwater tank and uh, divert our water that would have uh, flowed from the roof directly into the stream into the tank yes we can hold that water back to stop those scouring flows but we provide a private benefit because we now provide a water supply that uh, done properly can be at a lower cost and also can avoid uh, water restrictions we started thinking well okay that's good that that uh starts to reduce those peaks and we did a study in mount evelyn where we installed hundreds of these on um, houses around um, the area to look at uh, how effective it was in reducing flows but we thought to ourselves well this doesn't solve the whole problem because uh we also want to release some flows during those dry weather periods to sustain that habitat particularly for platypus during the periods uh, prior to breeding when the female platypus really needs to be uh, taking on a lot of food resource to uh, sustain itself during that uh, breeding period. And here we get the nice intersection of uh, what's called real-time control technology. So real-time con control, for example, is used in um, managing uh, roadways or train systems or all sorts of things. Uh, and it's used very widely in water systems. It's used, for example, uh, a, a really good classic example is the town of Bordeaux in the southwest of France, uh, uses really sophisticated uh, real-time control to manage the flood risk. Uh, it's, a, it's a town very prone to uh, quite dangerous flooding. And so we've been working with developers of these technologies to apply them to different stormwater management uh, techniques and seeing if we can get them uh, to work together. Using uh, a technology developed by uh, Southeast Water called Tank Talk, um, we have applied this real-time control to household rainwater tanks so that the tanks can now do multiple things. They supply water as they always did, uh, but now they also will, are connected to the Bureau of Meteorology uh, 
rainfall forecast, so what's called the Australian Digital Forecast Database. They download uh, forecasts uh, twice a day and they make decisions about whether that tank is going to overflow and they release water prior to uh, that rainfall event to reduce the risk of flooding. What we've been doing is saying, okay, well, if we're going to do that, we could think about how we release water and we could actually have targeted releases during dry weather periods as well to uh, uh, sustain flows in our waterways so that things like the platypus uh, can maintain a healthy existence in areas where they normally wouldn't. And we're really inspired, I suppose, by the idea of uh, solar panels. For example, when you've got enough power, you uh, contribute to that, that to the grid and you get some money for it. Uh, I could complain about how little you get these days, but that's another discussion. Uh, and we think there's a possibility to do the same thing here with water where uh, in times of drought, our, a householder may choose to use the water in the tank for their own purposes, but they may choose to allow a release for which they get uh, financially uh, rewarded. So we started saying, okay, well, let's think about um, uh, developing whole networks of these uh, systems that collaborate together. And we've started to work with um, the ARC training hub for optimization run by uh, Kate Smith Miles, a mathematician here at the University of Melbourne, to develop optimization algorithms capable of supplying the right flow regime for our lovely platypus, uh, but also uh, reducing the risk of flooding. And so, working with Melbourne Water and uh, South East Water and uh, Yarra Rangers Council, we are now developing uh, a, a real scale test, um, a full scale uh, test of this, where we are going to be installing hundreds of these uh, rainwater tanks in partnership with the householders. We will then be building a uh, communications and control network uh, that includes not only all those tanks, but uh, the Belgrave Lake, which is operated by the council, and the flood retarding basin at Monbolt Creek operated by Melbourne Water, so that we can deliver throughout the year a flow regime that um, matches the breeding requirements of the platypus. The system will always, of course, each individual householder's tank will always be under their control. Um, and the householders will have the chance to release water or not, depending on their uh, preferences. So we are monitoring the hydrological consequences of this. We're monitoring the ecological consequences of this, but we're also working to understand how the community interacts with this, what they think of this idea, whether they trust this idea, etc. So we, we see the social sustainability as a really, really uh, important uh, part of the project. So the project is just uh, really starting, but we think this idea has great promise. And uh, with Melbourne Water, we're starting to develop bigger picture ideas so that this type of technology would then be applied to new uh, development areas. So we can sustain new development without having such a draw on water resources because we now will capture our own rain water and be our own water supply catchment, but also to protect our waterways from damage. Thank you very much for listening. I particularly want to acknowledge uh, my group, which is the Waterway Ecosystem Research Group and uh, my very close collaborators at Melbourne Water, particularly uh, Rhys Coleman. I'd like now to introduce you to um, Associate Professor Robin Schofield, who's an atmospheric chemist. Uh, her work covers quite a range from uh, a stratospheric uh, ozone layer all the way to sulfur, sulfur production in, in oceans. And she's looked at pollution uh, from mercury in coal stations and more recently in airborne infection risk in hospitals. Who would have thought anyone was interested in that? Um, she's used a really wide range of novel uh, techniques and applied them to conduct measurements from all the way from Antarctica to the tropics. So she, I imagine, has a wardrobe with quite a range of uh, clothing types. And uh, she's worked really actively to improve the way chemistry is represented in our uh, climate change models, which is really important. Today, as you see, she's going to talk to us about coral reefs and a toolbox for um, when greenhouse gas mitigation is not enough. 
Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Um, I was just trying to work out to get my video on. Um, so manage that now. Um, perfect. Thanks for that very kind introduction. And yes, moving on to the refs. I just, um, I'd really like to start with a um, acknowledgement um, of the Wurundjeri people, um, the traditional owners um, from the lands on where I am today. And I want to more broadly acknowledge the, um, the original scientists of the lands, the sea and the, um, the air countries on which I'm uh, talking about in this presentation. So I'm asking a pretty tough question and, um, and, and, and coming up with an even tougher answer. Um, and, and so we'll go through that. Can we save our coral reefs um, and, and build that toolbox? So we've seen a number of um, Great Barrier Reef uh, bleaching events and, and we know that they would have been there, would almost have been impossible without the climate change forcings that we are currently experiencing. And so this is work um, in the conversation. You can read about this from um, colleagues of mine, um, Andrew King in, in our School of Geography, Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. So we know um, what's causing it, uh, and well, we and I'll discuss that further. But um, climate change happening now is causing the bleaching that we have been seeing. And so there are there have been proposals around geoengineering, and and that's mostly what I'll get into strongly. But I'm going to take a step back um, because immediately when we start talking about geoengineering, we see that we need regulations, strong rules, um, and, and we get into the legal and social, um, license issues. Stepping back for a moment, um, we, so where are we at the moment and where are we headed? And um, so the IPCC statement, this came out in 2018, um, for a special report on global warming, um, if we limit, limit it to um, 1.5 degrees. At that level, we will um, see a decline in our reefs uh, between 70 and 90%, and, and that's a 50% chance of, of that happening um, of the other scenarios they were looking at. If we could wait for two degrees um, or allow emissions that would put us on a trajectory for two degrees, we will lose 99% of our coral reefs around the world. So it's fairly grim. And if you haven't had the chance to check out this great ABC um, storyboard um, with inputs from Zebedee Nichols from our um, University of Melbourne's um, Australian German and Energy and Climate College. Do so. Um, basically, we have to start now. So you can probably see my cursor here. We have to start now um, reducing our, our fossil fuel use um, to stay within a budget here represented by this circle um, to reach, that's our 1.5 degree budget. And we want to be at net you know, net zero, <clears throat> we reach that in 2045 with this trajectory. So we have to start reducing our emissions aggressively. Otherwise, we, we are on this trajectory. And so, you know, a 50% a chance of, of losing um, 70 to 90% of our reefs is, is pretty grim. And we need to, we need to ensure that we um, that we find ways of, of not being there. So stepping back again, um, what, what causes coral bleach bleaching? Now you can say climate change does. Well, it's actually, you know, is it, um, is it the temperature? Is it the, the, um, acidification of the oceans, etc.? The story is actually fairly complicated and i and I will talk to that in, in, the, in the next slide. But if we just consider the ocean temperature alone, that's a pretty good proxy for bleaching. It explains most bleaching events, but 
but it doesn't explain them all. And, and actually what also is needed is worrying about the irradiance. Um, so that's how much sunlight is coming in from our atmosphere um, onto that, those waters, onto the um, corals. And, and that, those uh, factors combined provide us with the um, amount of bleaching that we can expect. This is from a colleague who um, is also part of the, this reef restoration and adaptation um, project that, that I'm partaking in. And, and they have a model called e-reefs. So basically they have a, um, an ecosystem model of the entire Great Barrier Reef system. And this is a nice complex um, biological modeling um, framework for what's going on. So you can see when you start thinking about these processes and, and then model them, they're really complex. And so on this side here, we have photons coming in and we have a number of pigments which interact with those photons. And, and most of those photons then pass their energy through to their reaction centers. And, and this is the, what you want to go on and you get carbon being fixed within the system. You make the coral, the, the zoanthellae, uh, the algae within the coral, um, which is giving it these nice colors, is making its food. And so that's, that's basically what this diagram is showing here. So we have, um, the photons can come in and they, if they, if the pigments don't like it, they can dispel it out as heat. Or if they, if it goes through this process, what goes on, um, usually you want to go this way um, and you, you can come in into um, these reaction centers. Now they can either be oxidized, um, ready to, to fix the carbon or they can be reduced um, or they can be um, blocking here and so inactive. And in the case that um, the energy is coming in because you've got lots of photons and it's coming flowing through the system fast and it can't deal with it quickly enough. Um, it can't go reduce it through that system here. And you want that reduction to happen. And that reduction is temperature dependent. So what happens is you create these re reactive oxygen species and, and the zoanthelae does this and the coral decides that that's not great for it. And so that's when you get the um, expulsion of the zoanthelae algae and you get the bleached corals. So that's what's going on and you can really see how layered it is. So you've got warm ocean temperatures uh, and if you have direct sunlight on that, you will get bleaching. And so what we're looking at in the, um, the reef restoration and adaptation program is a number of mitigation strategies. Now, many of them are, are basically in, in this category here, are, are looking at um, local interventions, um, cryopreservation being slightly different there. I'm part of this cooling and shading program and then that really squarely puts us into a geoengineering um, framework. So we can cool and shade, and we can cool and shade in different ways, all the way from a, a shade cloth up to what's called marine cloud brightening. And, and so I'll pop through here. So geoengineering uh, refers to the broad set of technologies which aim to, um, to deliberately alter the climate system to alleviate those impacts of climate change. And they're in two categories, solar radiation management, that's what we're talking about here. Um, we're taking sea salt and putting it into the atmosphere. And then you've got carbon dioxide removal, which is another class of geoengineering. I'm not sure if people have seen this before. Um, I, I'm pretty certain you have. So we have um, lots of ways of, um, that we have changed our climate. And, and so this is the anthropogenic forcing agents here. And you can see we've got our greenhouse gases. Um, so carbon dioxide mostly here. Um, and then we have our other greenhouse gases, methane, nitrous oxide, and mainly our CFCs and hydrocarbons there. What you can notice down here is 
while we've emitted large amounts of that from our fossil fuel burning, we've also emitted a large amount of sulfates um, and other aerosols which have blocked and screened. And so the offset that these provide actually mean that you don't add those bars all together here, you've actually got a reduction in that um, radiative forcing. So what we look at in the geoengineering is, um, is to harness that and to, to block and shield. We're engaging really strongly with the traditional owners um, of the, the sea country that we're doing this work on. Um, there are 76 traditional owners and owner groups and, and the, across the program um, we've engaged with, with them. Uh, in the cooling and shading um, we've engaged with seven of those um, and the program's just getting up and running. And so it's, it's really exciting and having standards uh, of engagement as well. So it's an exciting um, engagement during there. So to answer the question, can we save the coral reefs? Well, we will have a 5 to 15% chance of saving the reefs if we keep the temperatures to 1.5 um, degrees. We need free prior and informed consent from all stakeholders uh, and so the traditional owners but also from society. Geoengineering is not um, going to be done without social license. And, and then we need to know when, where and how to deploy the technologies and so that's, that's where we have to um, do all of this work now. So I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to our wonderful um, moderator, Dr. Michael Wheeler, uh, who moved here from Ireland to Australia to undertake a PhD at um, the University of Western Australia. He um, conducted that in exercise science. He's very passionate about um, science communication. He's worked on the Naked Scientists um, podcast from Cambridge. He won the three minute thesis um, during his PhD time and he joined our um, wonderful science communications team here at the University of Melbourne in 2019. Thank you very much, Robin, for that lovely introduction. And thanks to all the speakers for some really um, impactful presentations. I'm really struck by um, the, how large some of the challenges are that we, that we face, but also uh, inspired by some of the opportunities we have to apply science to try and solve some of these challenges. Um, so we're going to open up for some questions and answers now. So I'll invite the rest of the panel to turn on their cameras and I invite all the listeners as well to uh, think of some questions and pop them in the, uh, the Q&A function um, and I'll be able to feed those through to the, to the panelists. So if you want to ask a particular person a question, you can do that. Um, or if you want to put um, a question to the, to the whole panel, you can do that as well. Um, so I've certainly got uh, some questions of my own, but um, I do notice that um, we've already um, started to receive some excellent questions in the, uh, the questions and answers um, uh, chat function. Um, so first up, we have uh, uh, an excellent question for Ella. Um, um, so um, Ella, um, are there any other risks associated with uh, releasing new quals into established populations? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, I'm really glad someone asked that question because it's something we spent a lot of time thinking about, but I didn't get time to go into it in the 10 minutes that we had. Uh, and it's a really good question. There's a couple of things that uh, you would need to worry about uh, when introducing new quals to areas that they're not familiar with. So one of them is that uh, they might experience out outbreeding depression, which is the opposite to inbreeding depression, where individuals are, are too far not related to each other that they cause fitness problems when they're with their offspring. So there's incompatibilities in those two populations genetically. And we're able to show that this wasn't the case for the populations that we were thinking about through the breeding that we did in captivity, but also the work that was done on Indian islands. We were able to show that that wasn't a problem, but it was something that we needed to explore before we could do it more broadly. 
And then the second issue is that the introduced quolls wouldn't be locally adapted to the environment that you're putting them in. So they, the climate might be different or the habitat might be different and not what they're used to. And so we were aware that quolls used to move across all these populations when they didn't have big barriers created by humans in the way. So we weren't anticipating that to be too much of an issue, but we really wanted to make sure that local adaptations were preserved when you introduced new quolls into the system. So that's why when you would do targeted gene flow, we did a lot of work about when you would introduce those toad smart genes and it would be a few years ahead of a toad invasion so that there was time for the, the new introductees to breed with the locals and so that when that threatening process arrived and selection started happening, individuals with toad smart genes would also have those locally adapted good things in their genetic code and so that would also be promoted into the future. So you need to really be careful about your timing and how many you introduce as well. Okay, wow, that's fascinating. So, I mean, if, if this work needs to be done a few years before a toad invasion, I guess that means we need to be able to predict when those toad invasions are gonna occur. How do we do that? Yeah, so it's it's tricky, but it's doable and it, we do know a lot, so my supervisor and, and a lot of other people have been working on the toad invasion in particular, and we know how fast they move a year, but it can be quite variable if we have a really big wet season and they just all get washed down the river, or if there's a quite a dry season, they might not move as far. And there are a number of islands off the coast of the Kimberley that quolls live on. And so that toad arrival will probably be a lot harder to predict because it might be from storm events or from anthropogenic movement, people on barges and boats bringing toads to the island. So it's hard to predict. Um, but what you might have to do is um, do it enough ahead of time and then, and then keep up that introduction until the toads arrive so that there's still toad smart genes in the environment when they get there. Okay. Wow. Fascinating. Um, so we might uh, shift gears a little bit with this uh, next question, um, which is for both uh, Robin and Brad, whoever wants to have a go at it first, and maybe you both want to have a go. Um, so the question is, is it feasible to live with the standard of living expected in first world societies um, and aspire to by many other cultures without some reliance on fossil uh, resources? Uh, I'm happy, happy to take this one. Um, we certainly have the technology to, um, to transition away from a carbon-based um, energy economy. Um, we, can, we can do that now and, and, and that way we can maintain our standard of, of limit, living because you know, we don't want to regress um, and we have had great advances in both our health and education and, and poverty levels um, across the world. So this goes towards sustainable development and we can do that and um, moving away from a carbon-based energy system. Yeah. I might just add as well, like as we move forward, we definitely gonna to have to transform the way that we live. Um, if we think about pollution, um, some examples can be plastics. Um, we, it's not sustainable for us to use them continuously. And we definitely have to change our attitudes to um, our expectations for modern society. And, you know, the chemicals that we use, um, the easiest way to control not polluting the environment is to not use them in the first place and use them very specifically in specific locations. So I think, yeah, we're definitely going to have to modify how we, we live in contemporary society. So that definition of modern society will have to change. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, and we have a, a question for Tim here. Um, what percentage of um, uptake of the smart tanks that you mentioned uh, would be required to have a, an obvious impact on uh, platypuses or other animals? Um, how can we motivate people to, um, to also take up this new technology? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the first part about the percentage, we really do need quite significant uptake because uh, you know, each individual tank is a fairly small volume of water and we need to be able to sustain for platypus, there's really about two months around April, May, where flows are low and they need to be higher to um, uh, sustain good food resources for the female platypus. So we really need to be, you know, numbers sort of, uh, I'm going to say numbers that are approaching herd immunity. That's sort of, you know, 60, 70 um, percent. Um, how to motivate people. You know, there's a lot of interesting research on this and my colleague, Stephanie Laveau, who's a social scientist is um, a, a really important part of this project. People are motivated by different things. Some people will be motivated by the, uh, the environmental outcomes, they'll care about it. Others less so and will be more interested in money, uh, which is why we're using this concept, uh, you know, the same as we use with solar panels, that if you're contributing to this smart rainwater grid, you potentially uh, receive an environment, uh, a, a financial reward for that. that. This is where we're going in the longer term so that we can tap into people's motivations no matter what they are. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. And these, um, these uh, tanks, do they, um, you, cause you also mentioned there's a, an issue with um, pollution when, they're, when there's storm water, can these tanks help reduce uh, some of that impact as well? Yeah, it, indeed. So the first thing is when we retain that water in the tank, the water that then doesn't go into the uh, waterway system at all, obviously those pollutants don't go either. Um, but we can also, if we are doing these controlled releases, we can actually do those through a filter. And because we're now controlling the flow rate, it becomes feasible to uh, filter that water at its uncontrolled flow rate. You'd need a very, very big filter to be able to cope with it. But now we can do it in a controlled way. And as an example, we deployed this technology on a big commercial car wash in Mount Evelyn. And we're supplying water for that car wash and they using millions of litres a year, but they're also releasing water every day from that system through a granulated uh, filter media uh, that I developed uh, years ago so that we're releasing cleaned water into the, into the stream. Okay, wow, fascinating. And I'm kind of thinking of some um, uh, parallels with what um, Brad was talking about in terms of the, the different types of pollutants that, um, you know, exist in the environment. And I mean, um, filtering the water, is, 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 are we able to filter out the, the, the PFAS uh, chemicals that, um, that Brad mentioned? Or is, are they, is, it, is it much harder to filter those out? <laughs> I'm not sure if you wanted me to jump in or not. No, but that was question. that was actually my concern when when you were talking about the car wash. Um, um, a lot of new cars they advertise the fact that they can get this spray put on and it's oil and water repellent, and that's actually PFAS. And you can have that reapplied every single year. So these chemicals that we are exposed to, we think that they're safe, but we don't actually really they're not really fully characterised. And and then we'll find out probably there'll be chemicals in the environment currently that we don't know anything about that we'll find out in ten years are big problems. And it's and it's this chemical management issue is, is a big concern. So in terms of like the urban environment releasing pollution, yeah, we know that storm water, for example, is a big source of pollution load to rivers and um, car washes would be another place that I'd be a little bit worried about. Yeah, I, I should just clarify. So, so we collect storm water, give some to the car wash, their discharge has to go to the sewer. Uh, they have a, a trade waste agreement like all car washes. Uh, what we release to the stream is the filtered stormwater. Yeah, definitely not the car wash water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it seems like um, uh, a massive challenge. The 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 kind of the the delay or the time it takes to discover you know these chemicals are having a, a detrimental impact. I think you mentioned um, you know it was 50, 50 years in your um, talk there, Brad. Um, how what are some of the ways we can try and you know reduce that window and identify these? Uh, chemicals faster or you know I, I suppose more importantly identify which ones are the the worst offenders yeah that's a great question and sort of the holy grail of our field um what we really need is a transformation in chemical management in our society and you know the, the phrase that keeps coming up is what price for our convenience 
And we see this over and over again, not just with PFAS, but with pesticides, with flame retardants, with microplastics, all of these types of pollutants. They're, in many cases, the, 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 what we've done to the environment was not necessary. And so we should be deciding the chemicals that we use in specific locations for specific reasons. And so, so the easiest way to control pollution is source control don't introduce it into the environment in the first place. But the biggest problem that we face is that the burden of proof is put onto environmental scientists to demonstrate that these chemicals cause harm. And that takes a lot of time and resources. And what should really be happening is the burden of proof, similar to pharmaceuticals, should be on the chemical manufacturers to demonstrate that the chemicals that they want to use and apply in our society aren't going to be persistent and aren't going to be toxic. So until we have that sort of mindset change, we're in for we're going to see this scenario play out over and over again, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And uh, while we're talking about uh, pollutants, um, Robin, I'm really uh, curious to know, um, and some of the, the listeners are as well, whether um, some of these uh, pollutants are known to affect um, coral bleaching as, uh, as well. So, so nutrient runoff um, into the, to the Great Barrier Reef um, system is a really part, important part of the management of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, we know, like uh, dust storms, for example, um, provide a, a really important source of um, iron to, to the entire um, Southern Ocean. So, and when we're seeing with the fires, you know, that nutrient deposition basically over the atmosphere that way, it can come from the rivers um, as well. You know, it can, it can cause untold stress on the system. And, and we can see those pollutants that Brad's talking about, the microplastics the, um, and, and the PFAS, um, certainly the, the flame retardants um, over the atmosphere um, and into, into environments all around the globe. So um, yes, these things matter. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I mean, is there anything that the individual can do to help, you know, try and reduce uh, the impact of some of these um, pollutants or is it is it really just kind of on a you know the control sits on, on a higher level with um, you know around policy and things like that I, I'll come I, if I take this one briefly because it's a huge question um, but the Montreal Protocol is a pretty good example of um, you know it's the most successful environmental treaty that we have to date uh, and it's a mechanism to ban substances when we know they've done and uh, have the potential of damaging our, um, our environment ir um, irreversibly, really. Uh, if, if the um, CFCs were to have um, led to the complete destruction of the, the stratospheric ozone layer, um, that, that would have been um, hugely uh, damaging um, for everyone. But that mechanism, it, shows that international um, policy is extremely effective um, at banning these substances. But, and Brad talked um, about, you know, putting the environmental duty onto the manufacturers. Um, so it's that duty of care, where does that lie? And it's, a, it's you know, not really with the end users uh, who may be naive, but it's really with the, the manufacturers as well. So it, it's, a it, all levels, um, you know, better information about not uh, around the con consumption, um, but but regulation, uh, policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm just noticing uh, the time. I think we probably have time for a few more questions, but these are going to be the last ones. Um, and um, Ella, we've got a, a, a another question for you um, uh, about toads. Um, are there any hopeful plans for uh, decreasing or uh, removing uh, these toads? Um, well, unfortunately, with the technology that we have at the moment, we can't remove them from areas where they're established. Um, they just breed too proficiently. That's 200,000 babies a year or something insane like that. Maybe it's just 20. I probably just added an extra zero. <laughs> but a lot of babies per year. So it's really hard to eradicate them once they're established. 
-hmm. There are potential plans of being able to keep them out of the Pilbara. Because there is a a relatively dry barrier between the Pilbara and the Kimberley that could potentially be um, managed in terms of the water sources that are available there for them so that they couldn't actually cross that barrier during the wet season. It could be wide enough that they couldn't actually get across in time. So that's a potential solution for minimising the problem. Mm -hmm. But I guess it comes back to a trend that's been... Um, prevalent all night is that there are some problems that we can't reverse, some mistakes that we can't take back. Um, so thinking of new solutions and thinking outside the box and from a conservation perspective, it's really about uh, recognising adaptation in the populations that we care about and thinking about how we might be able to help species survive some of the threatening processes that we can't remove yeah oh, fascinating and it's um i should probably make this the the last question if we want to stick on time um ella just to to continue on um it's really really fascinating that these um uh quals have developed uh, a toad smartness is there any um evidence that this has happened in uh, other species as well or other yeah animals? yeah so there has been um some evidence that both the that adaption is happening naturally, but also that we can uh, promote it through teaching. So there's been a lot of work by Georgia ward Fear and um, others looking at goannas. And so they can have this similar behavior where they learn not to eat cane toads. Um, and we haven't, a similar trend to what we've seen in quolls has been seen in some of the other species. So populations surviving in small pockets in areas of cane toads. So there is, hope for those northern predators there is hope brilliant brilliant well thank you very much for that um that's all the questions we have time for tonight um thank you very much for tuning in and uh, listening to our wonderful speakers thank you also to our wonderful speakers for um uh, sharing some uh, great um information with us and uh that was that was some really great discussion uh, very much enjoyed it so uh thank you very much